Okay, well, this is a weird situation, and I welcome you all back to this uh, April Fool's Day presentation, since it um, couldn't be more appropriate, really, because uh, the folly of the species is so evident with the coronavirus, so uh, we're all uh, completely foolish, we can say. I want to say something about the, this lecture is a sort of transitional lecture because of well, because of this enormous hiatus in the first place. And secondly, because it's a lecture which um, was never really properly finished, so there are some images that are missing. And uh, I will try and pick them up next time, but there aren't too many. This image you're looking at here is, of course, the Maison Clarté in Geneva, finished in 1932, designed by the uh, Le Corbusier Pierre Genere, uh, the so called 35S studio in Paris, standing for 35 Rue de Sèvres. And uh, this building was made for Vanna, who was a metal manufacturer, etc. And you saw it uh, before, you know, we went over it in some detail. Um, um, it is very much a steel frame building uh, with um, stone on the end panels, otherwise it's very metallic throughout. And uh, I think if you recall, I mentioned the last time, it's a building very much influenced by the Maison de Verre uh, under construction in Paris from over the years, uh, well, I think you know, the last half of 1930, 31 and 32, finished in 32, designed by Pierre Charot and uh, um, um, uh, by foot, uh, who was the Dutch, uh, originally the Dutch partner, partner of Johannes Duyker, and, um, or Duyker rather, I think one should say, and they have worked together in uh, the Netherlands. They graduated in 1918. Um, um, foot had come to the Paris 1955 exhibition, and there he'd met Pierre Charot, and uh, for various reasons, some of which were personal, uh, he decided to stay in Paris from, the, from this point onwards, that is to say through the second half of the 20s, Bifut and uh, Charot worked together. And um, it is uh, argued by a number of people, including at the time by Eileen Gray, that in fact uh, Bifut was absolutely essential to the Maison de Verde. If you look at the work of Pierre Charot, there's nothing that equals the Maison de Verre before uh, his collaboration with, with Bifut on the building, and there's nothing that equals uh, the Maison de Verre afterwards by Pierre Charot either. And Gray, Eileen Gray, was of the opinion that it was this clever Dutch engineer, as she put it, that in fact uh, made the building possible. And the building was very much a montage and Le Corbusier was regularly going to the site, watching the building under construction through the years 1931 uh, to its, its completion in 1932. And this building was being worked on exactly at the same time. So we have every reason for thinking that the uh, Maison Clarté, which you're looking at in Geneva of 32, was in fact very influenced by the Maison de Verre. The two coming to completion at more or less the same time. And um, Le Corbusier and Pierre Genéret, in fact, uh, realize uh, two, sorry, four remarkable uh, buildings. You could almost call them high-tech buildings, proto-high-tech buildings, over the very short span of time between 1931 and 1933 one of which is this building, Maison Clarté in Genève, but the others are the Pavillon Suisse in the Cité Universitaire in Paris, and the um, Army de Salut in Paris, the Salvation Army building, a building for the homeless, in fact, and uh, finally his own apartment building in the Rue Nungesse et Curie in the Port Molitor area of Paris. They're all, uh, they're all worked on almost simultaneously and they're all uh, finished, certainly they're all finished by 1933. So one aspect that we will talk about uh, during this lecture 
is this uh, high tech aspect, if you like, which um, you already are uh, familiar with. This is the uh, Pavillon Suisse under construction. Here you can see it's a steel frame building, very much like the Maison Clarté, extremely economically uh, framed out. But the important thing here is that the frame is standing on a concrete earthwork, or rather, what, what should we call it? It's really a, a kind of platform, a concrete pa platform supported by enormous uh, uh, concrete piloti. And behind this uh, uh, four story slab sitting on a platform, um, is uh, the main public room, room, the common room of the uh, of this dormitory for Swiss students studying in the Cité Universitaire in Paris. And you'll notice that the, on the extreme right, just beyond the hoarding, you see this curved wall, uh, which is actually in rubble stone construction. And it's very important, this relationship between the steel frame structure, rubble stone construction, and the concrete uh, undercroft below the steel frame structure, because they can be seen and I'll try to elaborate on this, as the manifestation of these three uh, uh, cultural strands that Le Corbusier identified in his Voyage d'Orient map published at the end of the La Décotique d'Aujourd'hui, uh, of the Voyage d'Orient in 1912 that he undertook with August Klipstein and uh, where he covers the map with a little c, a little i, and f. i standing for industry, i.e. in this case the steel frame construction, lightweight. Um, f standing for folklore, i.e. vernacular, which is the rubble stone wall you can see here. And you could say that the concrete platform is somehow or other c in the map of 1925, 1912, 25, that map, uh, the C stands for culture, but as I have argued before, in my opinion, it is, it's sort of a surrogate for the word classic. The interesting thing is that this building, uh, the justification for the concrete platform was this um, very unstable, um, site condition, which you can see here in the section, because these piles go down through a cave. That cave is in fact the result of a quarry for lime uh, on the site, a big hole in fact in the ground, and it goes down to find a bedrock underneath. And we see it again here, um, and it also shows you, um, particularly on the top left hand corner and in the, just below that, that the building is in fact steel frame and you can see the position of the uh, steel I-beams. Between the I-beams, the roof slab, there are these hollow pot floors. Um, I mean, they're terracotta pots in fact, and onto these terracotta pots are laid a reinforced concrete slab, then uh, waterproofing insulation, and finally the roof tiles. And you can see this is the section top left. You can also see on the extreme left of that section, uh, stone cladding of the exterior of the building. Uh, uh, you can see, uh, if you look closely, A, B. Um, B is in fact block work, no, in fact brick work as a matter of fact, and then there is airspace, insulation, and plaster. So that is that section. And you can see the wall section beneath that, which shows, um, uh, no, sorry, this is still the, I think it's still the roof section, actually, it's not the uh, wall section, but we'll come to the wall section in a minute. Um, okay. Yeah. This thing I am not used to. Well, let's look at this for a start and we'll try to come to the wall section. Um, yes, what's extraordinary about this, and I've never, to be honest, I've never really looked at it before is that the, the paired piloti, the double um, long beam under the concrete platform, and you can see it sh shown there, 
uh, it, there are two ends where it's like a, sort of, um, a bone, a dog bone, so to speak, at either end. And then you come in one bay and there are two uh, kind of vaguely C-shaped uh, concrete piles. And then you come in one, one bay further and there are pairs of, of uh, piles with round corners. And so the whole thing is a symmetrical front and it's symmetrical in relation to the platform and um, in relation to the passage of automobiles, it's a platform uh, beneath the platform. You can see the tiled threshold of the building with square tiles that are, the whole building that is also interesting is asymmetrically situated in relation to the symmetry of the, the undercroft structure, which I've just been describing, which is a five bay structure and uh, the center line doesn't line up with the center line of the building. In fact, it shifts it off to one side. So there's a play here already between symmetry and asymmetry. You can see the threshold, the little door uh, in, entering into the tiled uh, um, uh, foyer. And out of this foyer rises this organic staircase, which finally feeds into the stair tower and the elevator. You see the elevator is immediately to the left of the entrance and you go around the corner to get inside it. And then if you keep going from the main entrance, you finally come to the double doors, which give you to the common room where there is a, a surgery, a kitchen. And beyond that, uh, in this long bar that's inclined uh, towards the front is the, concierge, the, the apartment of the concierge which shows you, um, well, it shows you a double bedroom, bathroom, and um, kitchen dining living, very, very tight. And above that is, I think, the director's study, the house master, in fact. And then you can see uh, in this kind of organic curve, the rubble stone wall, the folkloric elements. So if we look at the plan, um, uh, by itself, as it were, the the frontal element is the classic. Uh, the curved wall at the back is the folkloric, and uh, in between is the frame uh, stair tower, elevator tower, which is in steel frame construction, i.e., industry. So we've been there before, and we've been there before also. Where am I here? Come on, right. So that's the one I want. Come back. Oh my God. This is not so easy coming. Yeah, this shows the uh, facade of the building. You, you can see the uh, brickwork, which is uh, built around the steel frame. You can see the steel frame, the roof construction I already described, i.e. one, two, three, four at the top of the section, five, six, seven. You can see um, all the different parts. So that 10, for example, is the stone facing. Uh, and of course, uh, the same thing as before, insulation, uh, plaster, um, block work. And uh, you can even see the cramps holding the, um, the upper panel in position. And you see the construction of the floors. Again, it's quite obvious where the steel frame is. And, uh, okay. All right, so this is his own apartment, uh, finished at the same time as more or less the Vion Suisse, I mean, 32, 33. Uh, he's on the top floor. Um, when you look at this apartment, you can see that it's a steel frame, uh, it's a curtain wall facade, basically, but it's, it's not like the curtain, curtain wall facades we did. We see today it's much more complicated. Um, once again, you can see that the main elements of the facade are symmetrical, like the projecting bay that comes forward, which is actually five fenestration panels wide with uh, glass blocks uh, underneath the fenêtre en longueur. You know, the fenêtre en longueur is in steel, it's sliding, but there are, of course, uh, underneath that. So you have the 
notice that the entrance is again asymmetrical to one side, the main entrance. Then there's a first floor apartment, of course, with its own balcony, the second floor apartment with here, you can notice that the balcony is in metal mesh. The whole thing is in metal, metal mesh, uh, glass blocks, plate glass, steel. And at the top of the building, you can see the view from um, his own apartment on the top floor. In fact, his own apartment on the top floor is also two stories. And uh, I think you can see just out there on the vista, the the Eiffel Tower, for example, and um, you can see um, the uh, you know, one of these tables based on uh, uh, cast iron, uh, fixed on cast iron bases um, that he first used in the um, uh, Brussels, uh, the room for the young bachelor in the Brussels exhibition uh, uh, a year before. So, sorry, um, where are we here? Come on. I want that. Yes. So here we have the uh, plan of his apartment. And um, so his apartment, I believe, is on the right. And uh, so you see there is this uh, central uh, stair hall, uh, well, elevator serving that stair hall. And um, actually at the bottom center, there is a kind of open air gallery fed by this dog leg stair that also has a spiral, half spiral at the end of it. So you can get up to the gallery on foot and then enter the square entry hall that's serving two apartments, one to the left, one to the right. The one to the right is his. There's a light shaft behind all of this. If you go into his apartment, there are, you see, the, it seems to be that these are concertina walls that cut off the main entrance hall from the living dining. And then Constantina Wall again cuts off the, um, the main bedroom. It's all very small, uh, with, which uh, has a door opening onto a common toilet. You can see it there. It's quite a large space, in fact. And then there's a small um, sort of monk cell study room behind that and the balcony beyond. So um, it's a very small, very small apartment. Okay. Uh, in 1934, which is the year that uh, La Bire, uh, the Radiant City is first published in a book entitled Des canons, des munitions, mercy des logis, silver, silver play. Uh, uh, cannons, uh, ammunition, thank you. We, uh, dwellings, if you don't mind, basically. And, um, and in this year, 34, he, he works on, in relation to the Radiant City, something called the Radiant Farm, of which we see a perspective here, never built him. And we can notice that in the center of this perspective, there is a, um, a sort of barn-like structure, which is really, I think, more symbolic than useful, sheltering trucks, carts, etc. Uh, probably made out of corrugated metal on a um, skeleton metal structure. And uh, well, you can see utility buildings left and right. Um, so that's one image. The courtyard of the farm, the caption says. And here we see another version, more elaborated. This, will, this farm will be elaborated and exhibited in the Paris World Exhibition of 1937, which I will shortly come to. And uh, uh, so this is, this is this kind of radiant farm. You see at the top it says, uh, uh, Agri Agricultural Reorganization, 1934. So, um, uh, well, we see silos for grain, etc. Uh, we see axial approaches. Um, we see actually that the farmers are living or the workers are living in a kind of a small unité block. And we see uh, this is the top is the small unité block. There is um, agricultural buildings set up, shallow vaults 
they can be of lightweight concrete or they can be uh, of corrugated metal, it's, it's unclear which is which. But what is fascinating is that this is the shallow vault which appears in his work at this time so that one year later he will complete this amazing Maison Weekend de Saint-Cloud in 1935, which has a shallow uh, reinforced concrete vault over it. And uh, that will, the shallow vault will appear in his work from this point onwards. Otherwise known as the Catalan or Rousselin vault, Rousselin vault, uh, which was for, yeah, that's a kind of technique of Mediterranean fireproof construction in terracotta that goes back to the uh, 17th century and beyond. Um, Then, in this same moment, you see, well, not quite the same moment. This is 39 to 40, MAS, Maison Monte Arsec. The idea is prefabricated dwellings, uh, which are faced in metal, that have corrugated metal roofs, that are monopitch, but they pin, pitch into a central gutter, we notice. And um, if we look carefully, bottom left-hand corner, we see a plan. There is the usual kind of uh, piloti, but now reduced to two uh, tubular uh, steel columns. You enter, again, uh, separately and asymmetrically to the kitchen on the right and to the entrance hall on the left with a stair opening out of the entrance hall. And if you continue on, you will enter then into the living dining as one thing. When you go up the stairs, you come to a kind of square, uh, pause space that uh, before it is uh, a toilet, of course, and then uh, below are um, two bedrooms. You notice they're bunk beds, uh, one suspended over the other for children. And then, so that's if you turn right, having come up the stairs. If you turn left, uh, coming up, having come up the stairs, you come to the master bedroom and I believe to a kind of living room. <coughs> it's a little unclear to me, that might be I think it, it probably is almost certainly that is double height space over the living room on the ground floor. I'm, I'm, I was mis, misreading the plan. There's a double height space there so that the master bedroom raised up looks down into the double height space. And these are drawings and they're very hard to decode because uh, you know exactly what are these drawings. They're published with the Maison Arsec but it doesn't look anything like the um, systematic modular lightweight character of the Maison Arsec we've just been looking at. What's fascinating here is, uh, well, first of all, rubble stone wall appears again, um, timber, you see a big fuss is made over these timber bookcases, rubble stone wall, tile floors going out to a terrace, bottle of wine, purist table set, uh, the um, purist man is leaning against the wall, Okay, and if we go to another one, oh, back, okay, this one. Um, again, it's, it's, it doesn't correspond to the Maison Sec exactly. Uh, what, it, it's interesting, it's, it's already moving towards brutalism, in fact. For here, of course, it's made out of concrete, the, the upper floor is made out of concrete. The woman on the upper floor, which we take it is to be the master bedroom, is looking down into the living, that same, relationship, the man's out in the garden, um, the woman is in the kitchen, the dog is on the carpet, what can we say? I mean, it's a, it's a kind of early brutalist image, but not brutalist at all. And here uh, he's collaborating already very directly with the French constructeur Jean Prouvé. This is the so-called école uh, volant, the kind of flying schools which are quintessentially prefabricated. And uh, so that the roof would be um, in, what well, he uses the term toit plié, um, pleated concrete, pleated metal, I mean. And of course the panels are almost certainly metal, although he describes them as wood. It's, it's raised up on a sort of concrete plinth, just clear of the ground. The other, that's the only wet construction, the rest of it is dry. So this is also the moment of, um, it's also a somewhat high-tech moment. And as, at this moment, in this image, there's no evidence of uh, folkloric 
these kind of television window panels are typical of Prouvé after the Second World War. And uh, of course, they're in metal on the left above the map of Europe, right? And then you have this kind of raised floor, which looks as though it's made out of in situ concrete, which doesn't make any sense. So there is this kind of odd tension between lightweight metal construction and heavyweight concrete construction. And I suppose you can say that the tables in wood and the seats are folkloric. Okay, so I wanted to concentrate in this lecture on this extraordinary uh, exhibition of which until now there is no good book. It's really extraordinary because of all it. it it's kind of breathtaking that this exhibition was made. It was made by a very fragile government. It was, it was made under the auspices of that government, which was a, uh, uh, a popular front, so-called Front Populaire, uh, combining communist, uh, uh, international socialist, and radical socialist parties under the uh, uh, premiership of uh, Leon Blum, and uh, who was the first, uh, and I think, maybe until now, even the only Jewish um, Prime Minister of France. And um, uh, I think there's something about there was one earlier, but, but in any case, it, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary moment. And then, of course, it's on the axis, it's in the Champ de Mars, it's on the axis of the Eiffel Tower. And, uh, and uh, we're looking here at the four court of the Palais de Chai who were built for this exhibition, still existing. And on the extreme left there uh, um, is this monumental shaft with kind of crypto classical inverted corners on top and an eagle, which is the pavilion of the Third Reich. And this pavilion is directly opposite the pavilion of the new, newly constituted, relatively speaking, well, they're both newly constituted, Soviet Union, USSR, with a uh, a male and female worker uh, carrying between them a harry, hammer and sickle, which was the symbol of the uh, communist state, uh, on top of a kind of Art Deco um, uh, pedestal. Uh, the, the one on the left, of course, is extremely static and, and super monumental. The one on the right is rather dynamic. And uh, so the this setup, which is extraordinary, of left, right wing and left wing politics. In this image, of course, the right wing politics are on the left, and the left wing politics are on the right. I, 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 never, I, I find it very hard to get over this image, the, the way in which it's so, uh, so uh, categorically um, stated. You know. And um, uh, going backwards, very good. Oh, come on. Excuse me. All right. What we see here, of course, is the Soviet pavilion and, um, and the woman and man together, the hammer and sickle on top of this stone faced. It looks a bit like the language of Rockefeller Center, for example, which is probably no accident. And underneath, uh, well, this combination of heroic workers and uh, military, the revolution. And, uh, sorry, the opposite is this, you know, this is Ubermensch by, by definition. Uh, the, the, the pavilion is designed by Albert Speer. The Russian building is designed by Yofan, uh, who had won the Palace of Soviets competition, finally, the last Palace of the Soviets competition in 1931. And um, so uh, Albert Speer, who had been trained by Heinrich Tessinov, uh, classically trained, um, becomes Hitler's architect. I mean, the issue here is, of course, it's all happening at once. By at once, I mean 1929, the world crash of the stock market. Um, 1931, uh, the beginning of the Front Populaire. Um, 1933, the uh, seizure of power 
by the National Socialist Workers' Party, notice the title, which we normally refer to as the Nazi Party, uh, uh, which is, of course, a right-wing totalitarian government, masquerading, by the way, given the title, National Socialist Workers' Party, as a revolutionary um, government. And you could say, of course, revolution from the right, as opposed to revolution from the left. Well, here we see, this is the Exposition Internationale, uh, Paris, 1937. I mean, it, they start to work on this at the end of 1936. It um, runs through the best part of 37, but uh, Leon Blum uh, falls, the government of Front Populaire under Leon Blum falls, uh, I think in September 37. So it's very short lived and, and actually uh, represents an extraordinary um, effort. You see uh, the Trocadero, I think pre existed, but the Palais de Shire, which still exists, by the way, these two wings at the, on the axis of the Eiffel Tower, uh, uh, on either side, left and right, are uh, uh, foreign pavilions uh, from all over the world. And, and, um, and then, of course, the Seine and a whole uh, cluster of pavilions running along the Seine, then the Eiffel Tower and the Champ de Mars. So um, this is the site, and uh, this is a view back of the Palais Shire. Now you see from the other direction with the um, Soviet pavilion on the left and the pavilion of the Third Reich on the right. And actually, I don't know if you can make it out, but uh, if you look in the great distance in the sort of cradle of the left-hand wing of the Palais Shire, you can see the top of the Finnish pavilion, which I will shortly begin to talk about. This is by an architect named Don Dell. It was for a long time after the Second World War, the Musée de la Moderne. In fact, it's so, today it's called the Palais de Tokyo, refurbished, or you could say compromised, in a way destroyed, I'm sorry to say, by the French architects Lacaton and Vassal. It's an amazing monumental work, which was a very beautiful uh, um, art gallery, in fact, still is, part of it still is. You can see it's set up like a palace with these huge columns. The columns uh, are very, very tall. They don't, uh, they're not of classical proportions. They don't really end in classical capitals either but it's quite obvious that this whole thing is entirely indebted to classicism. Uh, you see it in the image at the bottom, what it looked like flood lit at night. This is looking out on the Seine. Uh, it, built by the city of Paris. In fact, it's the most, it represents, of course, the, the museum of the city of Paris. I, um, I did not say until now, and that's what makes the Paris World Exhibition so incredibly stimulating, is that the two things are going on at the same time, basically. Um, the Spanish Civil War starts in 1936. It's started by uh, Spanish right-wing uh, military forces that had been stationed in Morocco, in Spanish Morocco, who come uh, enter, enter up into the south of Spain. The reason for this is that um, uh, the Spanish Popular Front had um, um, gone to, the, to power literally um, um, in 1936 and the reaction, they were elected. There was a democratic election that put the Spanish Popular Front, which was like the French Popular Front, the combination of communist, socialist, radical socialist forces, anarchists also. And uh, um, so they went, they went to power in uh, 1936, in May 36. And, the, and I suppose work started on the World Exhibition of 37 soon after that, maybe two months afterwards. And this famous painting by Picasso, uh, the title is Guernica, for many years was in the Museum of Modern Art, has now been returned to Spain. Um, shows the, the little village in Spain called Guernica, which was dive bombed 
uh, civilian population dive bombed by um, um, Nazi pilots, uh, Junker dive bombers. And uh, this is a monumental painting, of course, um, representing the horror story of this, uh, this bombing of Gunnigan. And um, so this uh, work is a key work that was first exhibited in the Spanish pavilion built for the Paris 1937 World Exhibition. And there was another very uh, distinguished artwork in that pavilion by Alexander Calder called Mercury, a kind of fountain of Mercury as it happens. And um, so these two works were in Jose Luis Sert's uh, Spanish pavilion that was Sert having left Catalonia. And it's, it's important here to, to, to bring in the issue of Catalonia because the Republican government of Spain elected into power in May was very much centered on Catalonia. And Catalonia, in any case, was, still is, in my opinion, perhaps the most progressive uh, region of Spain. And uh, this tension between Madrid in the very center of Spain and Barcelona on the coast, the effective central city of Catalonia, this tension is, has, has gone on since the, the last quarter of the 19th century, when Catalan was prohibited by, the, by Madrid, etc. This struggle between uh, Catalan, Catalonian uh, independence and Spain, well, it's uh, still a topic right now. And, and the Spanish Civil War is very connected to all of this. Um, so the reaction, i.e. the right-wing military reaction against the Republican government comes from the South. The, the, and Generalissimo Franco is a leading military commander who goes to power through the Civil War. And the Civil War lasts um, basically for almost three years. It's uh, finally concluded in April 1939 when uh, Franco finally uh, um, seizes uh, Barcelona and, and the, the Republican government is over. And of course, many Spanish refugees uh, flee overnight out of Spain to Mexico and also into France. Um, very interesting story about all this is that despite the fact that the UK and the USA and uh, France uh, acknowledge the validity of the Republican government, they would not intervene in the Spanish Civil War. So this is, you know, non sequitur number one. Uh, with the result that after Franco's victory in April uh, uh, 39, in September 39, the beginning of the Second World War. So that, uh, um, you know, in a way, the Spanish Civil War is a prologue for the Second World War. So in a way, uh, what, what I'm trying to convey is the importance of the exhibition of, of 1937, the very delicate moment of the war. Here you see is a poster by uh, Jean Miro. It's called E de España. Um, it, you know, it's, uh, I think it must be a pamphlet actually. It has a price, one franc. Um, help Spain. And, uh, um, Yes, well, that's what did and did not happen. In fact, of course, 10,000 at least volunteers from the UK, USA, France, and Italy came to Spain as an international brigade to fight on the Republican side. And uh, the, the governments wouldn't intervene, but ordinary people intervened. The famous American Lincoln Brigade is from that moment. I'm just showing here, slightly gratuitous, a, a, but also quite beautiful, a, a, a mural by uh, Ferdinand Leger, also a figure of the left, um, for one of the pavilions in the 937 uh, Spanish, uh, sorry, 937 Paris World Exhibition. Okay, going backwards again. This is a fascinating pavilion built for the uh, 1937 Paris exhibition. It's for the French uh, glass monopoly, Saint-Gobain. You can see it on the top there, 
cut out letters. And it's a, uh, the dates here you can see are, well, it's very odd these dates, 1865, I think it says, to 1937. So this company uh, was making glass for, uh, you know, for, well, for a century. And one of their specialities at this moment are glass lenses. You can see them in the bottom of the image here. In other words, um, glass concrete construction. And you see it, uh, the entire pavilion is covered in this. And, and indeed, large parts of the Maison de Verre, which I've already mentioned, were covered in this. Now, on this occasion, Le Corbusier uh, designs and builds his Pavillon des Temps Nouveaux. Uh, for the expedition of 1937. I'm not sure who the horse is by, incidentally. I think it's the Spanish, the Spanish sculptor, but I'm not sure. And, uh, but what you see is, of course, a tent, or rather an inverted tent, inspired by, of course, the tradition of circus tents. And, um, and held in place by lattice, lattice, lightweight lattice steel girders, and by guy ropes, that hold the last steel girders with the canvas roof and sides in position. And uh, so it's really an inverted tent. Um, and with an interior like this, so that uh, you would enter this space, um, which would have this uh, yellow uh, canvas roof and at the rear, this red uh, um, um, canvas wall. And you see, uh, you will enter past an, a model of an aircraft, a, a French fighter aircraft, on, on a kind of um, a steel rod. And you see beyond, I think you can make out the word Siam. And it is, in fact, the Siam Charter that is presented as a kind of frozen book in, in lieu of an altar, in fact, you could say. And to the left, there is um, this uh, Balcadino uh, acoustic shell, come Balcadino, that uh, is, is a speaker's rostrum. The floor is gravel. Uh, you could hold lectures here, of course, and that was the whole idea. And this uh, acoustic reflector that's behind the speaker, you can see also a blackboard underneath this acoustic reflector, is uh, entitled A New Era Exists an era of solidarity. It also, of course, is reference to the Popular Front. And uh, this whole pavilion is about the Popular Front. And the strange thing is, and this is very typical of Le Corbusier, that his reputation as a radical figure meant he was never on the main side. So this, um, this pavilion to Tableau was uh, uh, on the outskirts of the of the city center was a kind of agricultural precinct all by itself. You see this model here, by the way, made by Colombian students, extraordinary model, which is now in the CCA in Montreal, uh, made for me when, uh, as a kind of a, a model uh, coming out of the course studies in tectonic culture. And uh, so you, you get the general idea there is this tent, and inside the tent there is this. Uh, promenade architectural uh, that has this form. So you see blue here is the, uh, the ground floor is top left. The uh, raised circulation on the right going up, on the, on the left coming down, is uh, all exhibition space within this volume. The red is in fact the back wall. Uh, there is a pivoting door here that uh, get, leads you, you can see that, uh, the, the top right of this page. And, um, and the uh, sections and elevations, of course, are, are underneath. And, and uh, the, so the itinerary of movement, uh, both entering and exit. So it is, is a, the term is look obviously, it's a promenade architectural, which is also um, an exhibition sequence, a, excuse me, didactic exhibition sequence. I come here. Oh my God. All right. I'm, I, 
in uh, the book um, Genealogy of Modern Architecture, I make the comparison between this Finnish pavilion by Alba Alto and I know Alto, two husband and wife architects, Helsinki, one in competition, unique in as much as it's built almost entirely of wood. There is some steel frame construction, but most of it is entirely wood. <clears throat> the main Finnish export after all, Suomi is of course Finnish for Finland. And uh, there is of course a spiral stair and steel, etc., etc. but mostly it is in wood. Very unique, top lit, you can see at the top here, one, two, three, four, five skylights and uh, no, why do I keep on getting that? Uh, this is the interior. On the, the section bottom right, you can see the skylights. The interior is the itinerary around uh, a little atrium. You can see that it's all uh, photo montage. It's uh, nationalistic uh, representation, represent, uh, representation of the, um, of the, um, Finnish timber industry, pulp industry, newspaper pulp, uh, and also furniture made by Artec to Alba Alto's designs. All of this stuff is, uh, is shown for the first time in this 1937 pavilion. And uh, yes, you see, the, what's fascinating here is that um, top left, you can see in red, the steel frame structure, which is partly suppressed um, and you know the the as it were cra it, this steel frame structure cradles the main space, which is uh, showing primarily Finnish textiles. And and uh, in the rest of the site plan, you can see the uh, steps going up. Uh, there is a piece of the one wing of the Palais de Chaux, and uh, and then there is the extraordinary kind of experiments with um, uh, columns like this this. Uh, bottom right here, you know, a cylindrical timber column is stiffened by timber blades, or the detail above that shows the cladding of the main uh, mass of the pavilion. As opposed to Le Corbusier's uh, um, high-tech uh, cable suspension, I mean, I think this is the first fully cable, wire cable construction in the world, actually. Well, there was a a Russian wire cable construction uh, soon after the turn of the century by an engineer called Trukov. And, uh, uh, but this is the next one. And you can see that the, what is shown in red on the left is, is the skeleton structure of the, um, of the um, ex exhibition structure inside. And in red are the guy lines and the main uh, restraining girders. And here you see what you've seen already. Uh, you see also the color scheme of the outside of the pavilion. So you're entering under a red portico uh, into a white segment with left and right blue panels. So in fact, of course, it's a French tree color treatment. And when you enter under the red, again, the socialist red, you are confronted with the socialist red immediately in front of you. And, uh, Okay, so I don't think what you can see in this image is, uh, uh, in, particularly in the top image, top right, you see uh, the beginning of the slogan, a new era exists, the era of solidarity. Okay, and uh, well, I'm, get, I'm getting out of hand here, okay. This is uh, is also uh, 1937. It's, uh, there was a famous communist leader in France called Paul Vaillant Couture, Couturier. And this is Le Corbusier's uh, uh, monumental uh, set piece to his memory. And, uh, well, it's, it's not so easy to analyze what is this all about when you see, one can see, of course, the scale of humans in relation to this monument. We assume that this bar, which is triangular in plan, coming forward, 
carried on a single column is inscribed uh, with, um, you know, with his life story and various dedications and so on. And then above we have this uh, woman who is uh, uh, really a kind of, um, it, it's really French, it's, it's the image of French nationalist, it's an image of the French Revolution in fact. And above this for the first time, this open hand, which we will also see in when Le Corbusier goes to, um, to India uh, in, uh, after the Declaration of Independence uh, by um, Nehru in 1947, Yawahal Nehru, uh, the British leave. Uh, India is partitioned into Pakistan and India. Pakistan primarily Islamic and, and India Hindu. And, um, and uh, Nehru commissions first uh, somebody, um, well, uh, somebody named Albert Meyer, and um, and someone named Noviki, uh, a young Polish architect named Noviki, and to be followed by Albert Meyer, who was a kind of professional, uh, a garden, an American garden city planner, as a matter of fact. And Noviki, the plan that Noviki makes for Chandigarh, because it's a commission to design the new capital of the Punjab, uh, is a plan that, to, in many respects, that Luca Corbusier will, will follow. And I will uh, pick that up next week because um, I will give this lecture with the title Passage to India. And um, so April the 8th is um, um, Passage to India. Um, April the 15th, Sacred and Profane. And uh, April the 22nd, uh, um, Le Corbusier and Alchemy, last works. So um, these are the three uh, exhibition, uh, three lectures with which this course will conclude. Um, I would like all of you who have not yet submitted a paper, either to myself or to uh, Oscar Arneson, uh, to do so by this time next week, that is to say by April the 8th, at the very latest, so we can react and um, somehow get you going. I will try to issue before that, um, also before April the 8th, before next week, a, a whole range of possible topics that one could uh, write about, uh, plus um, um, a list of current topics that we have received, and plus an outline of the future uh, uh, three lectures, in fact. So that will be coming shortly. I hope I'll get it out tomorrow. And um, yes, I, I would like to say something about turning points also in relation to uh, the present. Because it, it's quite obvious with the Connard CD19, um, this is also a historical turning point and not entirely unrelated to the turning point that I have been directly and elliptically referring to in this, um, in this lecture. And um, I, I have tried to show that in the early 30s, Le Corbusier and Pierre Jarret were very much oriented towards uh, uh, an industrial architecture, in fact, with the Maison Monte Sec, with uh, the Maison Clarté, with um, the curtain wall of the Army de Salut, which I will return to next week, the Salvation Army building, and um, with his own apartment block in the Rue Nongessa et Coulis. Um, so uh, that's, that's the first thing to be said. The second thing to be said about this moment historically, this moment being, for argument's sake, 1930 to 1939, is that uh, Le Corbusier is very involved politically in this moment, and in fact, joins forces with the uh, two uh, intellectual syndicalists, um, and of course, it, it, it's a, whole discourse about what 
what kind of political position did they occupy? Were they also, in fact, ultimately revolutions on the right? And uh, Mary McLeod, Professor McLeod, has wrote a whole thesis about this issue. And, um, but in any case, over the year 1931, Le Corbusier participated extensively with uh, Philippe Lamour and Hubert Lagardelle, who were editors of a magazine with the title Plan. And there, uh, I think there were 13 issues of Plan uh, published in that year. And, uh, and afterwards they shifted the ground to a second magazine with the title Prelude, to which Le Corbusier also contributed. And in fact, most of the chapters of the Radiant City, La Ville Radieuse, uh, published in 34 for the first time, first appear in the magazine Plan and in the magazine Prelude. Um, exactly as he had, uh, had been his practice with regard to the magazine L'Esprit de Vaux, edited by himself and uh, Aimé de Ozenfant, um, between um, 1920 and 1925. So there, of course, the, the, the essays that are collected together to make the, the publications um, Bear Sun Architecture of 1923 and Urbanism of 1925 first appear in the magazine of Spino Book. Likewise, the most of the material of La Vireria first appears in the magazine Plan, and uh, I think at least one essay from the magazine Trendy. So that's about this sort of double aspect of the Studio 35S, uh, 30, 35 Rue de Seven, 35 RS, Generate Le Corbusier, and of course Charlotte Perrier. And uh, this was an extremely fertile period, but also. Uh, extremely turbulent from an economic and political point of view. I mean, set in motion by the worldwide stock market crash at 29, leading ultimately to enormous inflation, to the fact that um, when Leon Blum becomes the president of France in May 1936, at the head of the coalition known as Popular Front, uh, the, the um, French production had not yet recovered from the 29 crash. And the fact is that uh, the popular front is short lived in France because of this crisis of capitalism. I mean, the whole thing, of course, has been produced by a crisis of capitalism. So, though the popular front has an enormous success when Blum becomes president, uh, they organize a general strike and with this general strike achieve 40 hour work week, two weeks holiday to pay, um, the union rights, etc., etc. Uh, the so-called Matignon agreement gives the workers all of this and, and they, they retain it really, although uh, the right of course, i.e. Uh, business power, the owners of capital are very reluctant. And we, are, we, we can see that we are in the same situation today, exactly the same situation as in, here we are 2020, and we're living through a situation which is almost parallel to the, uh, the crisis of 1936. And, and, and this extraordinary, uh, exhibition of 1937. So, and if you want to read more about all of this, uh, you can find it in chapter 24 of Modern Architecture and Critical History, chapter entitled Architecture and the State, uh, Ideology and Representation. And, uh, and there I, uh, I, I try to discuss in some detail the, uh, the, the architecture of the Third Reich, the architecture of fascist Italy under Mussolini, who Mussolini having gone to power early in 1922, before the crash, in fact, in Italy, famous march on Rome of 1922. A decade later, it, Hitler goes to power 1933. And um, so uh, this uh, chapter 24 should, yeah, I think worth reading. I will try to 
somewhere or other, get it online. So you, because it is, this transitional lecture, as I've called it, is about, it's both about the past, long since past, but also about the present. It's the two things at once. So it's a transitional lecture in more ways than one. And uh, um, I'd like to remind you just of, of uh, some other things. First of all, the First World War, which is, you could say, maybe the first capitalist competitive war, uh, 1914 to 1918, has as, has as its result the Russian Revolution of 1917. And, um, and, and of course, the creation of the Soviet Union. And the great crash of 1959, the stock market crash of 1959, has, has the result of the Third Reich coming to power, the, 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 uh, yes, the overwhelming of the Weimar Republic that had existed from 1918 to uh, 1933. And uh, six years later, the, first, the, the Second World War breaks out. So the Second World War is really a continuation of the first. And moreover, the Spanish Civil War is a kind of peace uh, in between, you know, the, the Civil War of 36 to 39, um, uh, which I've already discussed. So, and it's interesting, you know, Franco goes to power in 39, and he remains as the central powerful totalitarian figure in Spain until 1975, until his death in 75. And, um, the new Spain coming out of that had uh, many of the kind of uh, uh, echoes of the initial uh, divide was already present in the new Spain under the King of Spain. Okay, so that's all for this week. Thank you for listening. Uh, I will return next week with a lecture on the new habitat. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you.